My next guest, Tony Blauer, one of my dear friends, inventor of the Spear Method, which is the idea, Tony is a rock star in personal self-defense and not because he teaches jujitsu and karate and all that stuff. Uh, he is a guy who works with the law enforcement, the tip of the spear of the military, you name it, on, on fear psychology, on how to manage stress, how to weather the ambush. No matter how well you're trained, no matter how well you're trained, if you're not ready for something, you freeze. And we all do this. We, there's a, it, it, he calls it startle flinch, you know? And he figured out a way to kind of get the startle flinch, which is that, to work for you. And that's where that was sort of where, where spirit came in. And if you listen to this guy talk and you listen to the stories and you listen to his philosophy, it's fascinating. He's, he's kind of a genius. He's kind of a groundbreaker in, in, in not kind of, he really is a groundbreaker in the entire field of, of uh, I guess, psychology, the psychology of fear, uh, combat psychology, um, and just how to be ready for anything. Um, so it's a saturated market, but Tony's always been a guy who fascinates me because he's so heady, but he's also physical. He also put himself in a lot of positions. He also studied martial arts for years. He also gets in there. He's got this suit that they put on, and they actually just go. They just fight. Because the only way you can learn how to you know, apply this stuff is by actually drilling it at real speed, at real time. So everything about Tony is innovative, and he's one of my favorite people, and we had a blast. This was a great podcast. Um, I had so much fun talking to him. By the way, if you like comedy, if you like to laugh a lot, Sony Hall, this weekend, March 11th, I'm in New York City. Sony Hall, there's still some tickets left at briancallen.com. I got one show at 8.30. Come get some March 11th, all right, briancallen.com. Then the next weekend, Levity Live in West Nyack, New York. I'm going to be in West Nyack. I'll go right back to New York. And in West Nyack, New York, just over the Tappan Zee Bridge, Brian Callen's there, Levity Live, March 16, 17, 18. Come get some, and uh, let's have some fun. I'm happy with what I'm writing lately, which means you're going to laugh. BrianCallen.com for more dates. Brian Callen, this is his intro song. Welcome to the Brian Callen Show, the mother of all shows, the show that gets is breaking the internet. I've got Sensei Blower here, Sensei Tony Blower. Dude, what's going on? We've known each other a long time now. A long time. Two old guys. We had Two dinner old. last night. We did. I thought to myself, we have, we're fathers, we're husbands, we're men. We're both scared shitless of the world. It was funny. I was wondering if you can bring that up because uh, it's... Um, I think it's something that a lot of people think but don't want to admit. Yeah. Yeah, but they, everybody's scared of different things. You know, you get older, you start worrying about irrelevance or something, but also, like, your whole, your whole brand, your whole life, your mind has been around how you weather an ambush, how you protect yourself. Like, the first time I ever came across you, I, you were teaching Spear, and you said something I never forgot. You were like, you can be trained up the wazoo. You can know everything, but nobody's ready for an ambush. Mm -hmm. you, they, you've got to know how to weather the ambush. And they've, had, they've done a lot of studies on like kidnapping or whatever. People just, they just, you're not ready. Mm -hmm. It comes when you least expect it. I mean, there's a lot of <clears throat> neurobiology around it that helps yeah. explain it. I think that type A personalities of which you and I are, and then we're... We hang out with that type, right? And uh, there's a an unconscious bias to all training, and you think you're going to be ready, whether it's jujitsu, Krav Maga, uh, you're a gunfighter, you're a knife fighter. You think your system has the answers, and um, but but you're right. You you don't know until it happens, and there are so many other factors in an ambush, and and you kind of went into the physical stuff the stuff that's that's kind of haunted me for my life is the imagined fears which is even more noxious because that's just 
the fear factory in your mind. But in both cases, they're uninvited attacks. You're just sitting there, you know, you get a, a pain in your side and you immediately you, you run through like every diagnosis and you go, shit, what is that? Oh, okay, yeah. I just pulled that muscle. Or, you know, your daughter's supposed to be home at 11 and then it's midnight and you're, you're running through every scenario from... You're neurotic. Yeah. And I, th- and I think that most people are. And, yeah. and they just don't know how to talk about it. But fear has, has plagued me my whole life. And I like to explain to people, and it's a really negative... We, we should talk about what you do because, like, you've trained... You regularly train the tip of the spear in the military. You train all kinds of law enforcement, people who are always in real life situations, mm-hmm. right? And I've always wondered, like, and I want you to continue your thought, but but I've always wondered, like, how intimidating it must be to walk into a room of high-level operators, whether they're Delta Force or they're SEAL Team 6 or they're Green Berets or whoever, and you're here probably, comes you're this probably guy. Gonna be killed right after the show for saying those names. I understand. Okay. I understand. I shouldn't be you dropping all edge, these names, right? but I live on the edge. Maybe I'm part of that community. Right. But um, I cook for them. Um, <laughs> I'm their traveling concubine. But um, like, how the fuck do you walk into a room full of people with that kind of experience who are that sort of familiar with violence and familiar with real world violence? How do you walk into a room and say, hey, guys, listen to me. I, I have something to value. That's got to be – I was thinking about that last night, and I was like, how the hell do you do that? That's got to take balls. I do have giant balls. I know. I'm I can see them from you. your – no, okay. I can see them from your okay. tight and expensive <laughs> designer jeans. They were, uh, they were actually um, – hand contoured to support it, and if, if somebody out there is making the most expensive jeans on the planet the most like the japanese denim that takes a masters to to make and it takes like a month to actually render one pair of jeans <laughs> he's the guy who's going to buy them thank you yeah if there's just a regular bag that costs ten thousand dollars he's going to buy it thank you, you love you're you are a kardashian <laughs> uh, surrounded by muscle and wow. masculine energy. Wow. But talk to me about what that's like. You go into a room. It, you know, it's 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 kind of interesting because in in the world of combatives and defensive tactics, we're a boutique. We're word of mouth. And there's a lot of people who, like the old roadhouse, you know, they meet me and they go, I thought you'd be bigger. Uh, the uh, There are people who hate us. If I could monetize my haters, I'd be unbelievable. I'd buy more jeans. What do they hate you for? Um because I part of it is I think is there people are 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 they're getting tired of asked, hey, what about Blower? What about Spear? What about Blower? What about Spear? I think if you've never trained with me or my team, then you don't understand that all we're trying to do is make you safer. Regardless of your level, your experience, uh, we're trying to make you safer. And we're trying to make you safer using actual science. You've you've heard the expression perhaps trust the science. It's a it's a it's a tagline. You might have I don't know what you're it. talking about, Tony. Okay. Um, and and so our system is actually based on neurobiology, kinesiology, psychology, uh, physiology. So when we talk about startle flinch, uh, if, and it could happen right here, we could be talking and you look down for a second and there's like a spider on your leg that looks like it's really dangerous. You're not just going... You're going to be like, what? like there's going to be a yeah. reaction to you that. You hear a loud noise. You know. There's a loud noise. Uh, if someone walked in the room here and started shooting, I would grab you, use you as a human shield, uh, to try and get out of the room. Yeah, knowing, and I would absorb those bullets. Knowing and I, and, and they would while, deflect while, off And you. I'd say, I love you, Tony. Love my children and fill you right. with guilt for the rest of your life. Right, but but I've seen your abs and your back. I think they would bounce off I you. Know. You, also, you also haven't seen how well I throw throw knives. Keep the, going. The... But the point being is if if someone came in in the room right now and started shooting, you know, we wouldn't go, oh, fuck, karate kid stance. We wouldn't, like, start doing reverse punches. Yeah. We'd be like, holy shit. And you would do that even if you were concealed carry. This is, and so, like, how I've earned the trust, which is the operative expression, earned the trust of those elite people. Uh, one is there's, there's a, a segment of that audience that is, that, truly has beginner's mind, they want to be safer. They know that 1% change in a world-class tactical athlete 
can be the difference in mission success failure or them getting home or their team getting home so there's a group and i could tell you stories man uh years ago down at down at fort bragg we're doing something with with uh one of one of the elements down there and uh the other uh let's call them I'm trying to be discreet because because it's it's necessary to be discreet. There are d- different task forces down there. They're, but but their their sister components are in there like watching arms cross like, and I'm in there teaching, and they're like they're not doing the drills. That's right? that's yeah. Um, that's, but but they're the same world class, and it's it's bizarre. I look at that, and um, and the people in in the particular uh, uh, unit that I was working with are like. Don't mind them; they do this, and I see, and I see that in all the different verticals, all the different. So they're looking at you, verticals. going, "That shit doesn't apply to us because we do. We have a different." It's. I describe it really in a in a interesting. I think it's interesting philosophical sense of when you fall in love with something, you create a, rom- a romantic relationship with that. So let's say you love jujitsu. If you look at any violent encounter, and you look at the comments, there'll be. A stream of jujitsu comments, yes. a stream of yes. Krav Maga comments, a stream of Taekwondo comments. The knife fighters will go. That's why I carry. The gun fighters will go. Play stupid games, win super prizes. That's why I carry. And nobody's really talking about what neurobiology says. That's very true. And neurobiology says very that true. if a stimulus is introduced too quickly, executive function is hijacked. For a short period of time, if you get your shit together, your cognitive brain can't access the complex motor skills that you trained. And to, to piggyback on that, with the UFC, you watch guys, when they get hurt, they get tired, uh, they go to their happy place. If they started as a wrestler, they go back to wrestling. If they started as a boxer, they go back to boxing. You, you kind of go back to that, that myelin sheath, the, what's, what's, what's hardwired, the, the, the software that you've downloaded. I the love, newest software kind of goes out the window. I love that you in, inserted the word myelin. That myelinization of the neuron, yeah. that signal speed... And it's, it's, you know, Benny Orkidas. I don't know if you remember Benny the Jet, one yeah. of the greatest kickboxers yeah, ever. Him. So, you know, he said to me in 1980, what you practice is what you'll do. Mm-hmm. And, and that is like him just martial speak for, it's just decades old, the, you know, the, the, uh, the neurons that fire together, wire, wire together. I think I paraphrased that wrong. But it's just this idea is what you do over and over again becomes, becomes your default. So... What's interesting is you fall in love with a particular move, and this is kind of like heavy and nerdy, a little metaphysical. You fall in love with a certain move. What happens is uh, you create that monetization of that neuron. Your body releases dopamine and a bunch of other chemicals when you hit that arm bar or the kick to the face or the liver shot or the quick draw or whatever it is. And what that does is it seduces you to look to make that happen in a real encounter. So if I said to you, as a let's say as a, a Taekwondo guy, I go, what would you do if a guy walked up to you and strong arm tried to tried to mug you? Like, hey, give me your wallet. I don't need a gun. Just give me your wallet. Right. If you're a Taekwondo guy, you're going to kick him in the you're face. You're going to kick him in the face. Yeah. If you're a boxer, you go, oh, right you know, hand. uppercut, right overhand, right. whatever it is. You're a jiu-jitsu guy, I'll take him down. I'll choke him out. You're an MMA guy, I'm going to double leg him, ground and pound. Every person who is in love with their martial art will answer through the bias of that art. The boxer is not going to go, well, you know, in this case here, I'd run because the, the Taekwondo guy is not going to go, you know, I'm going to hit him with a good shovel hook to the floating rib. It's not part of his nomenclature or even his... Well, his it's not in his body. Right. You're going to sink to the level of your training and you're going you're gonna to react to and whatever. There's no neural pattern for it. So if you think about this, there's... Uh, an unconscious bias that's created by repping out with the system you love that creates a romantic relationship with that you are myelinating that neuron so the signal speed is fastest which means you're going to look to do the stuff you're good at you're going to avoid the stuff you're not good at Mm -hmm. and all of that and my hypothesis is all of that impacts your true functioning situational awareness and that means if 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 i say to you brian we walk outside the parking lot here if this happens, X, Y, Z, and your instincts and intuition tell you this, I need you to run. In this case, like... like. Um, so then, what is your anecdote to that? If, if we know that this is hardwired, and we know that, that there are certain instincts, right? There are certain things that happen where, you know, 
if I'm a boxer, I'm coming. You know, if I'm a, if I'm a, if I'm a jujitsu guy, I'm going low. I'm dropping level. But there is that initial thing where somebody comes up, grabs you, stabs you, puts a gun in your face, whatever it might be. So, so there's like I've studied violence, fear, and aggression for like forty years now. Yeah, it's a long time. Yeah, and I've noticed something that's uniform across human species, regardless of gender, and that is there's an immediate fear spike. There's a physiological, neurobiological response to danger, which is to uh, cover your head and or push your way danger, depending on proximity. Like that, right? So yeah, you this. look really bad doing that. Let me demo. Um, please don't do that again. I'm just See, saying. I know. Because what I do is I open my, I go like right. this. I go, I love you. I'm, right. I'm very Christ-like. Right. Yeah. So I just go, I love you, and I turn the other cheek. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And then you do a spinning back fist. That's exactly right. right. I love it. Yeah. Um, the... So inside of like a boxing slip, inside of that, if you looked at the untrained, and, and this is interesting, the untrained response to, let's say, a short left hook. I'm talking to somebody, um, let's say the mic is the guy right in front of me, and all of a sudden he, he throws a short hook there, and I don't, and I'm doing my Italian, come on, man, I don't want trouble. This movement, if I refine that, it's it becomes this, mm -hmm. right? So the, our, our spear system, which is finger splayed outside 90, driving, uh, connecting the kinetic chain of the cross extensor. This is all neural pattern, DNA level survival. Without any training, if I whip something at you, your hands will come up yeah. to protect your head. Yeah, you said that if something puts you in a headlock, you're like, I don't know what to do. Right? And yeah. the, 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 why people fail to convert that is they've never explored the insane power of, of weaponizing your flinch. Uh, there's a, a great line that I, I, I share from, uh, for a very brief period, I tried to take up golf. Horrible experience. If I had to, I remember... It's miss, impossible. I, I remember missing, I took my daughter, Olivia, golfing with me, and uh, and I hit the ball, and it didn't go very far. And we were alone on the course, and I made up some new swear word. I was so angry. And I whipped the club that went further than the ball. And my daughter, who's like seven or eight at the time, goes, hey, dad, the club went further than the ball. Is that good? And I was like, shut up. You know, like it was, it was insane. Uh, I don't know why I'm talking about golf. Oh, the um, uh, a, a very famous trainer, Jim Flick, he was talking about the difference between a powerful effort and effortless power. And when I read, when I read that, I went, oh my God, like that's what the spear is. It's effortless power because... The, it's a DNA level survival reflex. And if you could lean into that, it's the most powerful thing. So you figured out taking this and turning it into that is how you train. Well, it's, it's almost, it's, if, if I said to you, um, would you like an airbag in your car or not? What would you, what would I'll you take one. Yeah. We know that airbags save lives. If you removed every airbag from every vehicle, people would die. Right? People would die. The, the death rates from car accidents skyrocket. So we know an airbag saves lives. I ask this at every seminar I teach. Are you a good driver? Everyone thinks they're a good driver. I go, when you're drunk, when you're texting, you think you're a good driver. That's how stupid we are. If you're a good driver, how did you get in a car accident? Again, everyone's been in a car accident just about, right? If you've been driving any amount of time. Well, it's always the other guy's fault. So my metaphor... It sucks. Who, what amateur... I don't know. What amateur has their phone on? Amateur. Sorry, it might man, be for me. I gave it's your. Biden. I gave your. My phone's on silent. It might My be phone's on silent. That's so weird. All right. Okay. Um, it's really annoying. So I, I'm. I need to sorry, take. Sorry, Dylan. I need to take a break now. I'm like. I'm total. sorry. Keep going. Okay. All right. So, so this whole idea with the airbag is if you were sitting at a light, and somebody runs into the back of your car, T-bone, front of the car, at a significant speed, you want that airbag to deploy, and the airbag will mitigate some of the impact with your steering wheel or part of the car coming through right so i look at the startle flinch as a biological airbag that in the connection is an interesting metaphor because you don't when that accident happens you don't have time to push a button to deploy an airbag Ima imagine and this is an interesting thing of with of, with neuroscience block-based training versus brain brain-based training 
If I said to you, I'm going to throw an overhand right, you're going to do a rising block. But if I throw an uppercut, I want you to parry down. And if I do this kick, I want you to check it like this. And if I want to do this, you're going to cover like that. These are all complex motor skills. You need to read the pre-contact cue and the movement, and then you need to download and deploy the movement to intercept it. Action's faster than reaction. And in a violent encounter, the bad guy is always action in the context of a sudden violent encounter, a surprise attack. Um, so this airbag, I tell people, like, we're equipped with a biological airbag. If a stimulus is introduced too quickly, if I go, you know, if you're deep in thought and I go, hey, Bri, you're going to, dude, man, don't sneak up on me like that. It's just, it can be a micro flinch. Yeah. And so we built a whole system around that. Now I'm telling 19 stories at once. Let's go back to your first question. What's it like to go well, into a I room? I want you to finish the golf Thing. well the, the golf thing God, was yeah it, you go like on long fucking tangents i love them all right but what's the golf name. thing well the golf thing was just this idea of 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 understanding that when we try to hit the ball hard we usually right. shank okay, it I got you. we crush it okay so go back to now to walking into a room with these guys so it it took me years to explain this but i had this insight in 1980 when one of my students got dropped that i've been training uh um for a fight this kid mitchell he was 15 i was i was just turning 20 and i was training him i had wrestled i'd boxed i'd done wing chun obviously inspired by bruce lee and uh, i uh was training him in the biomechanics of all that slip block move you know clinch all, all this all the stuff so taekwondo boxing wrestling mixed martial art right 1980 and uh he gets dropped the guy sucker punches him in this altercation in school. And when he was explaining what happened, and I've told this story a thousand times, it's, it's still the same. It was like the God of self-defense hit me with a lightning bolt. And I had this epiphany, big fancy word for light bulb moment of like, holy shit, we teach self-defense wrong. And I said it collectively, like not I taught self-defense wrong. We teach in that insight, in that moment, I said, there there is no scenario when we teach self-defense. We say things like, Here's a gun disarm. We stick a gun in the face. But if I stick a gun in your face, do I want your property? Am I moving you to secondary crime scene to rape you or torture you? Or am I about to kill you? Because each scenario would infuse you with a different type of fear. And each scenario might also inspire a different strategy, a micro strategy. Even though the move might be the same, the moment if I go, I got no mask on, and I go get in the trunk of the car. And you go, fuck, this guy's taking me sicker in a crime scene. He's going to kill me. I'll never see my kids again. All that, and that's unsolicited, runs through your head. Um, versus somebody with a ski mask going, give, give me your purse, give me your wallet, whatever it is right away. So we went way beyond what's the move, what's the technique. And, and, and like to remind people, don't confuse technical with tactical. And that's, to me, the biggest mistake made in self-defense, in defensive tactics, combative training, is so much emphasis is on where does your foot go? Where does your hand go? Where does the move go? And and the reality, and I'll give you a, a great example. Um, I suppose I can mention his name. I think he's long retired. Ronnie Parker was a legendary uh, 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 SWAT cop in Texas. And he was a buddy of mine back in the day. And um, I asked him one day when I was putting together a gunfighting course. And it's interesting because we have like an operated course, a gunfighting course. I'm like, I'm from Canada. I've never made an arrest. Why would some tier one organization bring me in? And that's the thing I just say to people who hate on it. They go, Blauer, like, have you ever seen you in the UFC? Have you ever been in a gunfight? I'm like, you know, Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard hired uh, uh, their, their legendary trainer to train them. But at no point did they ever think that the trainer could beat them in a fight, right? There, there, there are people, these legendary trainers coach their fighters. Yeah, teachers. They have a different insight. Try this, do this, what about this? And then it's that tactical athlete that's got to try and make the shit happen. But the, um, the I, asked, I said to Ronnie, and what I'd heard as I met him, that he'd been in nine gunfights in all different SWAT, undercover, uh, on the street, and I asked him, because I have my own hypothesis, my intuition, I said, Ronnie, what stance were you in in these gunfights? And he looked at me, he goes, mm, you're not in a stance in a gunfight. And I said, that's what I thought. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I go, well, 
you know, but were you looking through your sights properly or were you just looking at the bad guy? He goes, if it's a gunfight, you're just shooting the bad guy. You're not thinking about where your foot is, where you're That's a really good but, point. But it's not that competition shooting. Lean forward, you know, both eyes open, see the sight. I don't know. It's, it's you should practice that because you might that'll that should be your well, the, that should be your default. You, you want to have the myelinated neuron yeah. that draws you know, the weapon. You want to you want to you it's like boxing too. Like the re, the reason you train over and over and over again, you watch the guys so that when you get hurt, you can't do it wrong. When you get hurt, you make yourself smaller. You you automatically know my hand is here. You know, you here's, can't do it here's wrong. Here's an interesting. Here's a new tangent for you. And I I I built this into an article that I wrote for the uh, law enforcement community called Emotional Use of Force. And I said, like every pro boxer understands what taking a knee gets them, right? Gets them an A count, right? Get, they get the ability to pause the fight. How many times, and you're a big boxing fan, how many times in the history of all the fights have you seen, have you seen a boxer intentionally take a knee? Intentionally take yeah. a knee? Like gets gets stunned with a shot or a body shot and the guy's about to move in to, for no, the kill. No, take a knee, yeah. And how, ma can't. how many times have you seen him, because you can intentionally take a knee. Yeah. Almost never. Right. Like you can maybe think of two or three times and you can't even remember you the get, If you get hit with a liver shot or whatever, you, you a lot of times you just go down on your knee. You're just but like... The, I get that. But <laughs> yeah. what's, but what's the question? Intentionally, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Almost none. Yeah. But how many times have you seen a boxer, a pro boxer, who knows the rules, understands in the context of this sport combat engagement that this guy hits me, I go back, oh, you're shit. I, I can take a knee. He can hit me with one knee down. The ref's going to step in. And I can get eight seconds to get my shit together. But how many times have you seen a boxer get hit with a, a shot, uppercut, hook punch, body shot, fall back and cover, go small, and then the guy moves in for the kill and then reaches out and tries to grab the other fighter, mm -hmm. opening up his center line and tries to grab the guy like he's a life preserver in the ocean. You see that in every good fight. And so I look. that's what we look at in our system. We look at how neurobiology, uh, how fear, how pain affects our neurobiology that it bypasses our cognitive brain. Because the day before you were in a rules meeting and they said, look, you know, we agree to this, you know, standing A count, you can take a knee here, no biting Mike Tyson. Like you have all the rules. Yeah. So my, my question for you is, how is it that a smart, trained pro fighter can't remember to do that when they get hurt and scared? And this is what I bring to these organizations where I go, listen, you're the best shooter in the world. You're the best knife fighter. You, you're, you can fast rope. You can deploy from 20,000 feet with a dog. You can do all that. But have you considered what happens if you're surprised? And or hurt? Hurt, scared. With <laughs> and a lot, of, a lot of guys, depending on the speed, uh, we have a, a model called ASAP. Awareness is uh, impacted by the suddenness, aggression, and proximity of the threat. So we all have, if I asked you, what would you do here, Brian? Everyone who answers that question has theoretical uh, um, awareness. They're imagining a future event and they go, well, I would do this. I'd parry like this. I'd do that. But you just don't know what you're going to do in, in the real moment. No, you don't. And, like, and so, I mean, that, like anybody who's been in a real situation, if you think you're really going to get a fight, you, you get numb. Like a lot of times, I don't care how much you train. A lot of times you can go numb, man. Your legs, you can't feel your legs. Your Fear is real, man. Yep. Especially if the guy's bigger. It looks like he understands violence. looks like he might be crazy. It looks like he might have a weapon. So it, That's in, scary it, shit. In, in all fairness, I want to qualify that and, and talk about a big fancy word called stress inoculation. So you're friends with a lot of like badasses who have been in fist fights, knife fights, gun fights. Uh, when you experience something a lot, yeah. it's a, you're, you can more quickly self-regulate. So, yes. So for example, yes. you, you've like, been there before, right? Well, something, something happens. They to still you. get nervous though. They, they do get nervous, but they, and, and this is why the whole no fear thing is about learning to manage fear. Yeah. And it's, it's understanding that a fear spike in your body yeah. is normal yeah. It's part of your survival doesn't system. Mean, yeah, it doesn't mean you can't operate. It doesn't mean you can't and function. Here's an interesting thing. And, and it, again, this is something we share because of the 
you know, all of us in t- if you're studying martial arts or if you think you're a badass, you don't want to talk about fear. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm okay. Um, understanding fear and changing a relationship with it can help you expand your discomfort zone and your holy shit zone so that if you visualize like all the things you've gotten good at, if you, if I said to you, so we've, we've got some friends that are retired badasses. If I said to you, uh, Brian, challenge, I want you to go up on stage and do an improv in front of 500 people who might boo and heckle you. You'll go, okay, dude, I've been doing that for like 20, 30 years. What are you, like, no problem. But if we said to one of the other guys, we're not going to mention names, go up on stage and and do a skit. Yeah, they'd be panicked. They, they, they might not even get up on stage. Of course. But if I said to you, there's a gunfight going on in there. Here's a gun. Run in there. Identify the bad guys. Don't shoot the good guys. There's women and children in there. Go in headshots only because they're wearing body armor. You'd be like, yeah. yeah, could somebody who's been doing... In other words... Of course. Right? We do that right away. You know, people, when there's violence, real violence, the first thing people do is they look for they look for the police. They look for people that have been there. They're right. like, I can't... Holy shit, so we're, you know... So I, I, wanted to, I wanted to share that because there there may be some of your audience listening going, this guy Blower's full of shit. When I have this incident, when this happens to me, I'm, I'm, I don't have fear. And a lot of, a lot of these really experienced people don't realize the stress inoculation, the training that they've experienced. But, and this is important in terms of self-actualization, like, like really evolving as a human. Some of them I've met are really good at this skill, but they can't transfer that to another skill, which might be communication, interpersonal. Look, dude, watch, I'm sorry, but you can watch it. an amazing NFL football player who's just an incredible athlete by far and then watch them hit mitts if they've never hit mitts put gloves mm-hmm. on them and watch them try to box it, it and watch how fast they burn out. it'll hurt your feelings yeah. oh there was a guy who was a competitive triathlete he was i don't remember he was like some ranked triathlete so run he got in the ring and tried to just move around spar a little bit but he wasn't getting hit right. he forgot to breathe yeah. So in literally less than three minutes, he was a he was had to sit down. He couldn't breathe. That's very common. Yeah, yeah. The first thing that happens if you if you haven't been punched in the face is when you're boxing, you get hit. The first thing people do, you can see Brock Lesnar, tough dude. Yeah. When Cain Velasquez started, started unloading on his face, he went down like that. That's what all human beings do. If you're not used to that, if you don't know how to deal with that kind of that thing. A boxer's right. not going to do that, but it just goes on and on. No, and it's the same thing. You, you. That's what's you, maddening about being ready for anything. What's maddening is, as a human being, you really are. Um, when chaos hits, you're you're pretty much well. And and this and this is why. So we have gunfighting, ground fighting, uh, uh, weapon protection course. We've got our confined space combatives course. We've got like a dozen courses that we've taught all over the world for decades now. If you said to me, Tony, you can only pick one course to teach the rest the rest of your life, I would pick our No Fear course, which is a lecture, which is a, a discussion, because I realize this, the people who manage their fear manage to fight. It doesn't guarantee victory, but it guarantees you're in the fight, which means elements of, of uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, dignity, uh, shame, vulnerability, anything that we feel like, I should have done this, I should have yeah. done that, that is mitigated by the fact that you're in the fight even if you lose yes so that's 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 pretty interesting and what about the, the idea of rehearsing for worst case scenario all the time i mean without being neurotic but shouldn't you in your mind be going through things like like just thinking about you know what if this just like you know just be a bit like i rehearse pepper spray i rehearse you know i'm with my kids i got shoes on that i can actually move in you right. know i I, I have maybe, uh, maybe, you know, if I'm in an area, I don't know, maybe I got some, maybe I got something on me, you know, right. just in case, cause my kids are there. Yeah. You know? So, you know, and it's interesting. I mean, there are, there are different people as you probably noticed, particularly in the last few years with the weaponization of fear, it's, it's amazing how many people just like smart people who just go, know this, know this, right? I, you know, you go to a restaurant, you look around, you look at your escape routes, you're, uh, you know, if I, if I go out, if I go to lunch with, with, you know, 12 cops, 
and then of course, you know, like everyone's going, I'll sit here, I'll sit here, I'll sit here. Are you armed? I'm not, like, it, and it's funny. And people who don't understand that think that we're paranoid. But if, if you think about any catastrophe that's happened, you, at the end of it, you look at it and you, you want to have been the survivor. Yeah, but also like I, I bought what drives me crazy is people walk around with a false sense of security. My my wife and people like that, they they just walk around with their baby and they think that nobody's gonna attack them because they're a mother and a baby. So who would right. ever attack a baby and a mother? Well, there are crazy motherfuckers crazy that people. do that. So yeah. you need to have an answer. You need to have rehearsed how to like are you rehearsing with pepper spray? Do you have a small knife you can stick in his fucking throat? You know, whatever you gotta do. There are people that will try to kill you. Or do some crazy shit. And most people freak out. All they can do is hold on to their baby and do this. And, yeah. and then it's too late, right? It's 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 tricky, man. Um, Just live in an expensive neighborhood. That's what I say. And have bodyguards. <laughs> the, uh, Sorry. The, I, I, I think Different some... Show. Different I, show. I think some people would think that the way you describe that would be paranoid and over the top. I think it's smart. I think it's actually, you should train for it. There's there's a balance. Yeah. I, like, I believe that everybody, in, in 1980, after my student Mitch got dropped, here I am, 20 years old, he's in the room telling me, yeah, and, and we we're in school, and then he hit me like that, and I go, dude, why didn't you wax on, wax off him? This was years before Karate Kid. Yeah, yeah. You know, but... but How about everybody who was telling me, I got more texts about, dude, if Will Smith smacked me, I would have fucking... I right. would have caught that shit and come right back. No, you wouldn't have. Well, and this is, I did definitely a, wouldn't have. I did a whole article on that. If people want to read that, go to my sub stack and, and, and read, read that article. It's really popular. Cause Tony it, Blower. Uh, com. uh, Tony Blower sub And, um, or sub stack. Tony com, whatever, however they, they do it. But, uh, it's your, when somebody's in your circle of trust, like right. if you're, if you're, uh, a mailman knocked on the door and he was going to kill you. You'd open the door and go, yes, can I help you? He'd, he'd sh stab you or shoot right. you. If your gardener did that, if, if somebody you knew, um, if something just looked like it's supposed to be there, our brain just does that. Yeah. And, and, but this is, this is where, uh, what I was talking about is everyone should understand. And this was the inspiration in 1980 scenario-based self-defense what are the things that happen frequently so it's not and this is the difference between being paranoid and prepared you can't train for everything possible but you can train for everything probable uh this podcast is brought to you as usual by uh ketone iq um ketone iq are uh basically ketones you can drink now um i believe in this product because oh yeah it was developed by DARPA, and uh, the Tour de France uses it. Tour de France. 60% of the bikers in Tour de France use Ketone IQ. Uh, and I believe they just signed a deal with the Special Forces community. So this is kind of exciting. So um, if you want to take two groups that need measurable results, like something that they're going to put in their body that they know is going to work, uh, well, those two groups are pretty reliable. So um, Ketone IQ is somebody who takes it when I need energy and I can feel it right away. Uh, I recommend it. Hit me up. Let me know what you think because it's kind of amazing. Um, so it is. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you the, you go to HVMN, okay? H as in human. Uh, let's see what it's, it's human. Uh, no, wait, it's health via modern nutrition. Not human. <laughs> so HVM, Health Via Modern Nutrition. HVM.com slash Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, for 20% off. Give it a shot. The promo code is Brian. Give it a shot. It really does work. It's clean energy. And uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that claims that. But uh, I like to go with uh, the kind of product that people who need energy where their livelihoods depend on energy and endurance take it that's those are the people i'm listening to i'm going to do it with that so ketone iq brain fuel clean energy get some so you just look at probable is if i'm at an atm 
is there any chance that I might get mugged? Well, you, you kind of like, you do a little research, you go, oh, ATMs are, people get mugged at them all the time. So th having a plan at an ATM isn't paranoid. It's like, I don't want that to happen to me. Yeah. So now you start thinking uh, about that. Uh, home invasion, more and more frequent. Carjacking, more and more frequent. Just being able to just be alert. And this is, this is another thing is, once, once you go, this could happen, these things happen, then take ownership for it. Understand, to your point, and just as somebody who's been doing this for decades, you will get paranoid in the beginning when you start researching it because you're overthinking it. But what you want to make sure that you have is a logical flow. We call the timeline of violence. Detect, defuse, defend, the three Ds. Detect and avoid, defuse and deescalate, and a push comes a shove, know how to defend. Once... Once you've got kind of this map, it changes your situation awareness. And, and in not too, it doesn't take that long, you can start to relax into you're hanging out or walking and you go, shit, I need some money. You go to the, you start to walk to the ATM. Your reticular activating system reminds you, this is where you scan and look. Is this a good ATM? Uh, is there anybody around here? My intuition, like every victim of violence who lived to tell the tale said they had a bad feeling before the attack. My buddy said that my buddy grew up in a really bad neighborhood. And he said, you, the, when shit was about to pop off, the air would change. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, I don't know, man, just the air would change. And I was like, he knew, he knew something from, energetic. He grew up, he grew up with that shit. So he knew before it popped off to get the fuck out of there or to duck. Yeah, and listen, here, here's here's a scary expression. Because we always say, like our overarching, our umbrella principle in our in our system is choose safety. What is the safest thing you can do? You're, you're Run, a father, you're an entrepreneur. But listen, your father, you're an entrepreneur, you're a businessman. Um, um, lover. <clears throat> lover. Um, Answer. Doesn't matter. You do keep you do long talks on stage all around athlete. It doesn't matter. Keep going, podcaster. In other words, giver. Like twenty year old Brian would be like, let's fucking go. Like, but now, how old are you now? Seventy. Fifty six. Okay. 50 yeah, but I'm biologically like thirty. Dude. Right. But but <laughs> but dude, like right now, if something happened, what you don't want, you don't want your twenty year old Brian to make the decision. You want your fifty six year old Brian to make the decision. Yeah. Right, and so we can't be cavalier about violence. And if you train only how to get out of a headlock, or how to do a gun disarm, or how to shoot somebody, or how to, you know, stab somebody in the throat, to use your mm -hmm. expression, it we're not practicing de-escalation. We're not practicing avoidance. This is a true story. 1988. This guy, he's still my friend. He, uh, I met him at, at the seminar. Uh, he's in life insurance. He's my insurance salesman from 1988. His name's Larry. Hi, Larry. Um, we're sitting there in my school in Montreal. And I said, listen, the fight's going to happen over here. We would dress up before I built my, the high gear system. We do like Frankenstein, you know, cue cushion guy, helmet, uh, hockey gauntlets, uh, baseball shin guards. And we dress up, we do these scenarios. And I'd say, um, as soon as you can break contact, I don't care if it's a bitch slap, a, a headbutt, shove the guy. I want you to sprint. It was about, it was about 45 feet to our juice bar in our in our school if you can get to the juice bar that's safe haven that that's a, a hospital it's a police station it's a cop car i'm teaching you to break contact he puts up his hand and he goes with all due respect mr blower i think we all know how to run we came here to learn how to fight and i said the fact that you don't want to practice or incorporate the decision to break contact fight, yeah. and run means you're going to let ego or pride maybe and it was a very subtle thing that people don't think to do because usually I think about this all the time. I, I, you know, it's like you can train and you should train. You should know what to do on the ground. You should have a sense of wrestling. You should have, but yes, 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 yes to all that. But you know, man, real violence is weird. First of all, it's usually not one-on-one. -on -one. It's probably three-on-one -on -one, or it could be, you know, there's so many things that your Kung Fu is no good here. You know, at the end of the day, for the most part, your Kung Fu is no good here because there is a lot of here that you've never seen before. You know, it, it's, it's uh, like, I differentiate between sudden violence and douchebag fights in a douchebag fight. Your Kung Fu might be good. Your Thai boxing might be good. Sure. Your boxing, I'm, I'm going, you want to fight? Let's step outside. Sure. We square off. 
And even then it can go south. But sudden violence, you know, there's, there's an expression we share all the time. And it's violence loves speed. And the speed I'm talking about is the, the intensity of an immediate attack where you're looking at somebody, all of a sudden, like your buddy said, something changed, and all of a sudden, whack, they're like, here comes a hand, here comes a foot, here comes a, a knife. And your, your body-mind in that system is deploying its biological airbag. It's not, it's, you're not going for your gun or your knife in, in that moment. Yeah. And that's that, what I'm trying to do to come full circle to some of the stuff we talked about when we first started, is I'm trying to make all good humans safer by teaching them how to use their airbag use their airbag but to to make sure it's turned on everyone's got it yeah i had a guy he's 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 I, a, yeah i had a guy professional tie boxer 10 years wanted to teach for me felt, felt came to one of our programs because his his now wife wanted to do the training so he's jeet Kune Do for 30 years uh, fought in thailand if you if you looked at him you go no defense like his face is just so fucked up right <laughs> he's just he's no just defense but but if you think about tie boxers, it's a battle of attrition. It's yeah, it click, is. kick, bang, it bang, is. bang. They'll stand uh, right in the pocket. Uh, right? And start exactly. house kicking the fuck out of each other. So um, his name's Casey. So uh, so uh, so he says to me, he comes to this, to this gig I'm doing, and uh, he goes, yeah, Casey, I'm a tie boxer, Jeet Kune Do. Uh, yeah, Natalie wants to do the course. Uh, so I knew he wasn't there for him, but he'd heard that I was a pretty good coach, so he wanted to learn just as a coach, just how I manage the class and stuff. He comes up to me after he goes, this is not what I thought it was. Uh, this is behaviorally inspired. It's like all the fear management, all the situational. He says, I want to get involved. I, he's, he has a gym in Carlsbad. He said, I'd be doing my community a disservice, not showing them this. He says, not everyone can learn how to box or tie boxer, but they can learn how to choose safety. They can learn personal defense. So he comes over to my, my, my uh, garage gym. And I asked him, I said, okay, like, let me see. You got to be able to replicate the flinch. And, it, and he couldn't flinch. Now, this is interesting. He couldn't flinch because he was so, you. he had trained. Yeah. His, his neurobiological system was, if let this guy come in and then counter or then clinch. Yeah, yeah. And he had weaned the flinch when he knew there was violence. And it took me literally weeks like this is like an old shitty kung fu movie throwing shit at him brian i'd go okay try and flinch on it whip something at him he'd go hit him in the head and then he'd flinch late and i go it was like the, the silliest thing right and one day finally and he's trying to flinch but he looks like madonna doing vogue dancing like he's he's like his very complex motor skill but your startle flinch like if i hear if i pretended that there was like a like a snake or a spider on me and i went fucking shit right i did that yeah if you watch that back and and you did that side by side with a real flinch, you wouldn't tell like like I can replicate it sure. like it's real. And he couldn't get anywhere close. I said, I said, Case, as much as you love the spear system, you can't teach it if you can't flinch. Because we need to inspire people that that the type A personality goes, I don't want to flinch. Flinching's for cowards. You're not trained if you flinch. Not realizing, and I got videos that we use of George St. Pierre of Mike Tyson, of Frank Shamrock, the greats flinching in fights. Cause, and they're in a, a fight where they knew they were going to be in a fight. You faint, you faint. I mean, some, that's, that's a point faint. Some guy did like something. That, the guy goes like that. Yeah, you know? and, and, and they're all, you can see the micro flinch in there, the push away danger. And so it's interesting. Imagine if you don't know that you're in a fight, <laughs> yeah. what that does. I watched a guy um, last year. I was talking tall, kind of good looking dude. But a local from Venice, and uh, there was a fight across the street, and he kind of he said, "Calm down, guys." And the guy came, just walked up to him, drunk, and walked up to him in an aggressive manner, and and just like you could see, he was he kind of went, "Oh yeah, what do you?" And he walked up, and this guy, without even missing a beat, just went like that, shh, and painted his painted the guy's eyes with uh, pepper, spray. pepper spray, just went. Shh, and then the girl came up to him and tried to kind of attack him. And he went Shh, like that. And he goes like this. He looks, he goes, you should wash that out with milk and gets in his car. And I go, he was like working security. Mm. And I go, dude, what, what's going on? And he goes, what about the cops? He goes, the cops know me, dude. And I was like, and he just got in his car and just drove mm. away. 
And I was like, that motherfucker knows violence. That guy's so, been very, very... He's he's been acclimated. Ex, yeah, stress and experienced. Uh, he's he's done that. Another day of the but he but he also when and he, and that's not the first time he'd done that right. either. You could see that he but, knew how well that was going to work. That's, and that was my point before. If, if we talk about you know Andy or Mike or Evan or any of these guys who've been there and done that, um, they've seen it. So they go, okay, imminent is becoming immediate. Let's go, right? And so. Uh, uh, imminent danger. It looks like it's 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 coming towards me, and then you say or do something. It's still coming towards me. Imminent becomes immediate. When this guy said, "Hey guys, like knock it off," he had already indexed his his OC. One hundred percent. Right. So. Yes. So, but but this is important. What's indexing OC? Uh, indexing like do you ever touch your penis all the time? Right. But don't call so, it a penis. Okay. It's what a do cock. You, what, okay. Penis sounds. Smaller, so, yeah, right. So if if you've got a knife on you, and you're sitting here, and all of a sudden you touch it for a second, that's indexing, right? You index your weapon. Yeah, that's you're where just, it is. Meaning you just you just know where it is. Yeah, you're just reminding yourself where it is. So when this guy saw this happening, he no doubt he went, and it was just like, oh yes, I did bring it. It's there. I know it's there. I know where it is. And he probably had it in his hand already. And it's all stuff that you wouldn't notice. And you're going, how's this guy like so? so calm and it's and it's literally and i use i love the adjective he painted them because you know jesse was trying to save some money and we hired a painting crew at the house and they did a horrible job because they didn't know how to paint and then we had to have it redone by a little bit better painters and the more you do it the better painter you yeah. get well right? this guy this guy that was his go-to some yeah, people's a left hook this guy's just smart yeah this guy's like i'm not gonna get yeah he was big strong or you could see he could have fucked him you know fucked you up but he was probably six three but why why dude let me just i just can just do that with my wrist well there's a there's a cool expression i want to share with your audience force must parallel danger force must parallel danger that's the moral ethical legal thing to do and force so must parallel danger right so had the guy walk towards him and he kicked him in the balls and you know uh, uh the guy doubled over need him in the face and now the guy's got injury to his groin broken jaw broken teeth more, more of a problem you know like you know, is your that, eyes you just wash out. With is that water. a lawsuit? Is that so? Is it was the least level of force, and also, I don't want to get this this guy's bloodborne pathogens on me. I don't know yeah, who he is. All that shit. So, so it's it's understanding, uh, you know, what to do. It's it's another line. I like Jocko Willick's thing. Jocko Willick was like, if you come at me and you're yelling at me, I can run away. You know, if you try to punch me, I can run away. You know, where it all changes, you know, where it all changes is if you grab me because he's a jujitsu guy. And it takes courage to run. Listen, here's the neat thing about fear that I want to share because I don't know how, we're gonna, how long we're going to talk about it. You can't be brave if you're not afraid. Agreed. A lot of people, I don't know. That's a great point. A lot, of, a lot of people don't understand that the primary ingredient inside of courage is fear. Of course. I don't even know that courage exists. F courage would be when you're scared shitless and you assume the position anyway. If you're not afraid in a situ of the unknown then you're probably a fool. Hicks and Gracie talks about it in Choke. Mm -hmm. says fear and intelligence are very closely related. That's from Hicks and Gracie. Yeah. I don't know anybody who's not, you know, like like Andy Stumpf will talk about when he was doing a squirrel suit, like he would jump with that wing suit. He did the craziest shit, and he's like, it's not risky to me because I'm so cautious. I'm so right. careful. Because of I'm fear. so meticulous about it. Yeah. You know, so in Ben, you know, to be part of a special elite unit of operators, you're probably in some ways safer because they're highly professional, the best training, the best well, equipment, the this, best planning, you know. This, and this is the thing behind the whole No Fear program. So I, I, I debated wearing my No Fear shirt or my Fuck Fear shirt because the Fuck Fear uh, shirt, just I knew that would intimidate you. And yeah. I didn't want you intimidate me, you know. But fuck fear isn't me being like a crass American and swearing. It's an acronym for face it, understand it, control it, and know it. Mm. Face your fear, which means I've got to look at it now, which means I will begin to research it, whether it's Google, YouTube, talking to a buddy, what would I do if, and you start to explore it. So now you're understanding it. Then recognizing that until you do enough reps, and then even maybe then it doesn't matter, you will still have the energetic sense of fear anticipation of danger i mean if you told me before let's say your next biggest 
show ever, you're you're like, man, I'm not even nervous. I'm not even. I'd be concerned you would be flat. There there yeah, needs right, to be right. there needs to be you some anxiety, some anticipation yeah. yes. of this. And if you can go, oh, fuck, I'm going to use this energy. I'm excited versus I'm scared of the energy because now one of my favorite favorite quotes, Dan Millman, way the peaceful warrior. He said, if you face just one opponent and you doubt yourself, you're outnumbered. Mm-hmm. One of the greatest quotes ever. It's true. Because if I'm here going, oh man, did I prepare for this? Am I ready for this emotionally, psychologically, physically? Now I'm, I'm threatening myself by my self-talk and I still have the problem in front of me, whether of it's you know, stand up, uh, a stand-up show or a violent uh, attacker. But you can't be brave if you're not afraid. If you... In in the in that fuck fear acronym is face it understand it now I need to do something I control it and when I do that repeatedly I get to know fear and that's the stress inoculation process for the roller coaster that is life that helps you self actualize as a person. Um, what's your course like? Where can people find you? And I want to do a best of with you. I, I told you that where I want to actually take your course and I want to actually go through the process, but how long does your course take? And like, what's it called? Where can people find it? All that stuff. So it, de- it depends what we're doing. Uh, th- there's one that's been in- insanely controversial called be your own bodyguard. And I started this concept and idea back in the eighties. You weren't even born then. I don't think I know I'm so young. And, and uh, it was like 86, 87 where I asked um, a group of women. This is f- fantastic. Do I have time to tell the story? Okay. I'm sitting there, I got 20 women in the class, and uh, and I say to them, um, I walk out, and I go, Albert DeSalvo, how many of you could take him in a fight? That's how I started the class. And they're like, do you know who Albert DeSalvo is? Mm-mm. Right? Most people don't. I go, Boston Strangler. Oh, Boston Strangler. And these 20 women look at me, and they go, I go, Boston Strangler raped 2,000 women, got bored of that, started murdering them, then raping them after they were dead. Jesus. Like about a dozen. He was a boxer in the army, regular looking guy, would dress up in like a, you know, like uniform. Bring him up. Uh, knock, you knock on the door, hey, I'm here for the electricity or gas company or whatever. Get in there and I go, how many of you could take this guy? Before you answer, before you answer, remember, He's very good at raping. That's right. Two thousand rapes. I mean, that's like he's there, a master. He's got there, his ten thousand hours. There's, there's no, there's no, there's no pro fighter that has two thousand fights. No. I said, is that so, true? Is that a real number? He raped two thousand. I believe women? so. I believe Jesus. so. Jesus. That's what he alleged. This seems insane. Uh, it could be maybe, maybe we'll double check. Handsome that. guy. Yeah. So he wow. like what so a psychopath. Right. So I scare the shit out of them, Brian. I might be way off on the numbers. That was the the alleged rumor, but it was. Uh, well, they'll say shit. Guys like that will say a right? bunch of shit. But listen. But but here's the whole point of the story. Check this out. There's there's 20 women sitting there, and remember we talked about anxiety. Yeah. I decide I'm going to start this new course yeah. by scaring the shitter to people, and my heart's pounding because like I've never normally it's like okay I'm going to teach you how to stand. No, but this is a great stand. question. I th- I mean I love this question because it's real life. So I looked at them. I said, "How many of you could take Albert Salvo in a fight?" And they said, "I don't know who Albert Salvo, Boston Strangler. He raped thousands, hundreds of women. Then he murdered women." I said, "So before you answer, remember he's a master of his craft. Like a weird way to describe a serial killer." It's true though. They went like this. They got small. They started looking at whoever they came with. Yeah. I go. Nobody, nobody could take Albert DeSalvo. And they're like, like looking at me. And uh, one of the women at the back, I always remember her. Uh, she ended up continuing her, her training named Francine. She puts up her hand halfway and she goes, is he raping me or killing me? And I said, wow. Ooh. I said, that's a fascinating question, Francine. Yeah, because I know what the answer is going to be for her. And I go, listen, let's say it's the end of his career. He's going to kill you and then rape you you're getting both but he's gonna murder you first and all the women are like what the fuck yeah is this class it's, a, it's already a scary question right? from some this is like the first five minutes of the class and she has her hand up halfway and she goes well i know i can survive a rape so i knew why she was there but i don't think i could survive a murder and i said you're 
I'm going to agree with you on that. So what is it? She goes, I guess I'd fight. You guess you'd fight or you will fight. And she goes, I have no choice but to fight. You have no choice or, and I wrote on a whiteboard, I have no choice but to fight. And um, uh, I crossed out all the words that just left the word fight, right? I fight, right? And it was like just left. It's pretty cool, that's, man. That's, and the whole powerful. group, the whole group was, I got goosebumps now, like re reliving this. And, um, and it's, it's freaking nuts, man. Like just thinking about the energy in the room. It, it was like the, the mid eighties and my heart was pounding, Brian. Cause I was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like who starts a self-defense course? Smart idea, man. And I, I look at them and I go, 19 other women, you're not fighting this guy. And they're like, I go, guess what, Francine? You're the only one that lived because Albert DeSalvo said that anybody who resisted him, he let go because he didn't want to get caught. Bad guys don't want to get caught. They don't want to get hurt. They don't want for things to take too long. And they also say that if you have an assertive personality to begin with, you go, what are you it, doing in my house? Get the fuck out of here. It you know, could that, work. A lot of times that works. Could like work. there was a guy who said that he would ask women for a light and the women that, you know, before he would rape them, right. and the women that would say something like, um, I don't smoke, you know, they were just, a, and keep walking, he didn't mess with. Right. It was the girls that were like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't, you know, they'd be yeah. all, it, and it's like, that, that's why, yeah, kindness to strangers not not if it's just some dude asking you some fucking random question, you know, and never let that guy take you anywhere. You got to fight like a motherfucker. Yeah. It's like if a black bear attacks you, it's trying to eat you. So fight. Secondary it. crime scene. Don't do it. And I say black bear only because when black bears attack you with grizzlies, you're supposed to play, play dead. Black bears, you fight back because they're trying to eat you. Grizzly bears are probably just being territorial, and if it's a polar bear, you you die. Okay, keep going. <laughs> just bear knowledge. Bear knowledge. So, um, just the bear facts. Yeah. So. So here we are. I say, to, I say to these 19 women, I go, Francine, good job. The rest of you, your dad, sorry. At this point here, like these other 19 women are like, what the fuck's going on? What kind of class is this? And I looked at them and I said this on purpose, and this is why I was so nervous, because I knew I, I had kind of imagined how they would react to the first question. And I said to them, I'm so sorry. I'm new at this, teaching self-defense, that is. Uh, probably I, I should have started teaching how to kick somebody in the balls, right? And they looked at me like, I, like what type of faith did they have in me at this moment? They're like, it's like I want refunds faces on. Like They're like, what the fuck is this? I go, guys, I'm so sorry. Um, again, new at this. Let's start over. Let's start the seminar over. And they're sitting on my floor doing, and if I came with you, they're like, like doing this. I go, how many of you have kids? They all put their hands up except for Francine. I said, how many of you have babysitters? They all put their hands up. How many of you go shopping and hire your babysitter? They're like, they all put their hands up. So you come home, this is a true story, um, you come home and your door's slightly ajar. You open it, you got groceries in your, in, your, in your hands, and you come in and the babysitter's on the floor, duct taped, tied up, gesturing to you that someone's in the house, but you already know that. You hear some noises in the kitchen, and you put the bags down and you're walking and you hear this faint music and you come in and there's a guy with massive headphones on listening to, you know, some like crazy death metal, obviously, or something like satanic music. And he's slowly pulling down his pants and your kid has been stripped nude and is tied to the table. All of these things have happened in life. Dude, this room erupts and they're screaming at me. What the fuck kind of seminar is this? What are you doing here? What is, and there's a woman sitting in front of me and she looks at me, her, her carotid veins coming out of her neck, screaming, how dare you put that image in my head? What the fuck is wrong with you? Nobody touches my kid. I will kill anyone who tries to touch my kid. And then another one goes, I'll rip his fucking heart out. And I look, wow. yeah. I look at her and they're, the room's going nuts. I calm everyone down, I'm patting the air. Whoa, 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 whoa. I go, ma'am, what did you say? And she's like, she goes, the fuck kind of seminar is this? What is going on here? I go, what did you say you would do? She said, I, I'll rip his fucking heart out. I go, medically, that's impossible, but I like what you're, what you're thinking here. I like this aggression. I go, 60 seconds ago, I asked you, who would fight Albert DeSalvo? A five foot seven piece of shit coward who let anyone go who fought back. And none of you wanted to fight him except for Francine. And now 60 seconds later, you're killing a guy 
who's about to rape or molest your kid. Where did you get your fucking black belt in 60 seconds? And they looked at me. I said, what happened there? And one of the days they were saying, nobody touches my family. And I said, you're your kid's bodyguard, right? And they went, yeah. I said, who's your bodyguard? Such a great, it's powerful, dude. And I got to tell you, that's a fucking powerful way to start a class. Jesus. Dude. I mean, that's where your genius comes in. That's impressive. That became the Be Your Own Bodyguard program. Fuck, that's good. And, and so. Wow, I'm going to tell that story. You tell me a lot of stories, I, I repeat. That's a great well, one. But, but here's the thing is like, like, if you were out and watching your kids play. I mean, that image too of a guy listening to satanic death metal and peeling his pants down slowly. I don't You're know where to come psycho. up with this shit. But it's fucking genius because like, I, that's all I'm going to be thinking about because that is fucking real life. And that has happened to people in life. And it's like, you know, that, that's, that's amazing. So who's your bodyguard? The, 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 and, that, and that is the biggest thing is there is somebody or something in your life. And I make this joke. We would tell after, after, after you know, years of doing the seminar, like it's been decades now, um, I was teaching a bunch of cops and I'm blending it into a, a cop speak. And I was like, we called it the three P's, personal, passion, president. What are the three things that, that if I knocked you down and you were on the ground, I'm stomping you, what are the three things that you would think of that would get you up, that you'd be like, ah, like that scene in a movie where you go, ah. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the being the hero in your story. And uh, so we make people write them out. And uh, this one cop, everyone's going like, uh, my daughter, my son, my wife, my this, my that. And this one cop at the end of this, like 40 people in this class, he says, number one in his list is his cappuccino after work. Number two is I stop him. I go, sir, did you say cappuccino after work? And he goes, yeah. I go, look, I'm a huge fan of the Java bean, but if I've got like three guys kicking the shit out of me, I'm on the ground in the fetal position, I don't see myself going, my cappuccino and getting up and kicking the shit out of them. Yeah. And everyone starts giggling and um, he's not. And I go, I got to apologize. Maybe I didn't make myself clear. He goes, no, Mr. Blauer, you're perfectly clear. If you permit, I'll explain to you why cappuccino is number one. I go, go for it. And I, I kind of cross my arms like Kramer and Seinfeld. And okay, what? Like, go ahead, sell me cappuccino. And he says, um, I'm a senior in my police department. And uh, over, the, uh, uh, over the years of my career, um, I've seen a lot of bloodshed. I've lost lost good friends in the line of duty i understand what it means to be a cop i mentioned i'm a senior i'm chief of police i make the shifts i work days my wife and i split up a few years ago we're still good friends our kids are are grown up live in different parts of the country pretty handy with my hands and uh every day after work i come home and i make a cappuccino and i sit on this deck that i built with my hands on this lake and i watch the sunset and i think about what it means to serve and protect while I sip my cappuccino. That's pretty cool. And I looked at him, Brian, and I went, okay, cappuccino's okay then. That's good. Like, and yeah. what I learned from that story is if we could find what it is, we will bodyguard. You will become your own bodyguard. Yeah. And it I could be, that. it could be cappuccino. It could be your kid. I love and it. I, and I've joked, I said, hey, you know, I've had people go, I have no kids. What do I put? I go, you know, your wife. I hate my wife. What about your dog? I hate dogs. Ooh, weird. Do you like cappuccino? Like, it's like... Yeah, yeah, you find something. You find something. I love that. It's man. a psychological I trigger. I love that. I love how so much of what you talk about is psychology, which is why you have so much confidence when you walk into a room of operators dude, or anybody. Dude, the mind navigates the body. But what I do with these guys when I walk in, come back to the first question of the, of the day, is I don't walk in there competing with them. I walk in there truly trying to serve I, the first thing I say with any of these groups, and if you talk to anyone that's trained with me, ask them, because you know a lot of people that I trained 20, 30 years ago. What was the first thing out of Blauer's mouth in the first two minutes? It's, it's thank you for your trust. I'm honored to be here. You guys are the most courageous people I know. Right? And like anytime I go in, and I'm like a kid in, in when I go to any one of these organizations or a, a, a post, a base, a police department training place, I'm like, this is courage. So where do people find you? Be your own bodyguard. Be your own. So uh, my main page, we have four verticals in my company. We've got all our spear system, which is this, this whole understanding the neurobiology and weaponizing startup flange. We've got our high gear. We've got uh, stuff I do coaching and then our no fear program. And the best website to go to is called blowertraining.com. B L. Oh, sorry. Blower training systems. I don't even know what it was. B L A U E R systems. Uh, blowertrainingsystems.com 
And I hope that's the website. We should check it out. And uh, it's got all, all the links to all our other, uh, all our other websites there. Um, did I do that right? Bring that up. Um, Flower training systems. Right. And, um, and, and there, uh, you know, if you, if you scroll down a little bit there, uh, da, 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 keep going down. And there's the four verticals, spear system, spear high system, gear, high gear, no fear, coach Blower. Yeah. Awesome. And, um, we do have, uh, an ebook called making friends with fear. It's free. It'll put you in my funnel. My funnel will try and sell you our digital, no fear program. You don't have to get it, but I will tell you this. If you change your relationship with fear, you literally can con change your mind. What's the only resource we can't regenerate in life? Our uh, time. Time. Yeah. So when you're in the fear loop, you're consuming time. Yep. If you can recognize through physiology or psychology that you're in the fear loop and you have doubt, hesitation, and procrastination, and you could self-regulate faster, you're actually... You can be in it. You can be in... You can witness it. You're, and you're managing time. It's pretty powerful. It's awesome. Buddy, Tony Blower. Thank you, sir. Very good. Sensei Blower. How about that, dude? Learn some shit, right? This has been the Brian Callen Show. I hope you learned everything. <laughs> Brian.